Hello everybody and welcome back to another A-Level Chemistry exam question walkthrough video. In this video we're going to be taking a look at Bourne Harbour cycles which is part of the thermodynamics topic. If you'd like to have a go at the questions yourself you can download them from the description and then watch my video and mark your work as you go through. I will be modelling the thinking behind the question and writing this down in blue and I'll be writing down the answers that are going to get you the actual marks in green. In this video we're going to take a look at a 15 mark question to do with Bourne Harbour cycles. The question starts by asking us to define the term electron affinity for chlorine. Now there's quite a few definitions that you need to remember for this topic and I'm not a big fan of remembering long sentences. So the way I choose to remember the term electron affinity is through an equation. And so I remember what an equation for electron affinity looks like. So let me draw one out here. And so because this question was asking us about chlorine, I've written an equation which has got chlorine in it. And now we've got the equation, we can begin to construct a sentence that defines electron affinity. Now it's an enthalpy change, so we're always going to begin by saying it's the heat energy change for something to happen. And now we've got the equation, what we can see is happening is one mole of chlorine atoms is turning into one mole of chloride ions. And then that's all we need to say for the first mark. For the second mark we need to recognise the state symbols and say that the chlorine atoms and the ions are both in the gaseous state. And as I said earlier, you've got quite a few of these definitions that you need to remember and it can be quite daunting to remember two long sentences like this, whereas remembering an equation for a definition is much easier, particularly when you're close to your exam and you just remember this is electron affinity and you're just confident that you can put that into words once you've just sketched that next to the question in an exam. And sometimes the equation itself can actually get you some marks. This equation might well be worth one mark, certainly for quite clearly demonstrating that both the atom and the ion are in the gaseous state. So I recommend that as a strategy to remembering these definitions. Then moving on to part B, this is a six mark question and this is really rare, I must be totally honest, I've chosen this question because it gave me the opportunity to demonstrate a few different skills, but this question is typically going to be a three mark question where you're going to have to complete a Bourne Harbour cycle. You wouldn't normally have so many gaps as this. You can see we've got a six mark question and we've got six gaps. Typically now they seem to have moved on with these questions to make it three gaps but you need to be able to think on your feet and fill in any of these gaps as we work our way around the cycle. So to help you with that I wanted to give you an overview of what Bourne Harbour cycles should look like down at the bottom of the screen. So first of all at the very bottom of a Bourne Harbour cycle we always have the ionic compound that we're going to be making and then on the next level above, such as here, we've got the elements. And so magnesium solid, that's the elements. And the elements turn into the compound. And this arrow is the enthalpy of formation. And so up here, we have our elements in their standard state, making a mole of ionic compound. And Bourne Harbour cycles generally look a little bit strange, but all they are is equations that are turned 90 degrees. And so we've got our reactants here, which are the elements. And then this is the turns into arrow. And this is the compound that has been produced. And so they are just simply chemical equations that are rotated at 90 degrees to the standard way around. And once we've done that, we can add an extra level of usefulness to it, which is that when the arrows are pointing downwards, this makes it an exothermic reaction. And when they're pointing upwards, which most of them do in the Bourne Harbour cycle, this is an endothermic reaction. And then as we work our way around the cycle, what we do is sequentially, we atomize one of our chemicals, which means turn them into single gaseous atoms. And then we atomize another of our elements, and then we need to ionize our metal element and then we might have to ionize it a second time 
if it's a two plus ion, for instance. And those last four arrows have all pointed upwards, which means that those four are all endothermic processes. And then what happens is we have to turn our gaseous non-metal atom into a gaseous non-metal negative ion. And that's called the electron affinity as we had up at the top. And then depending on what the negative ion is, we might need to give it a second electron and then that would be an ion like so. And actually quite a common follow-up question, which isn't the case here, is that the question asking why is the first electron affinity an exothermic process and that's because we're making a new attraction between the non-metal and the electron whereas the second electron affinity is an endothermic process and that's because we are putting a negative electron in with a negative ion so there is repulsion so there is quite a lot of energy needs to go into making that happen. And then the final arrow is pointing from those gaseous ions, we've now got a positive ion and a negative ion, and moving down towards the ionic compound, so completing the rectangle shape that we get in our born harbour cycle. Now this is the enthalpy of lattice formation. At least it's lattice formation enthalpy when it starts up here at the ions and goes down to the bottom. We need to be careful what we're asked to do with our born harbour cycle because we might be asked for the lattice dissociation enthalpy or given the lattice dissociation enthalpy. And that's the exact same length arrow, but it points the other way for the dissociation of the ionic compound into those positive and negative ions. And so now we've constructed our template born harbor cycle down at the bottom, we can start to fill in and quickly fill in this one that we've been given. So our first rung is the elements. So if we're making magnesium chloride, and we've already got the element magnesium, that means the other element is chlorine. And we need to remember that the elements need to be in their standard states. And so the standard state for chlorine is for it to be a diatomic molecule in the gaseous state. And then we have clearly looking at this, they have already made the decision that the first arrow is going to atomize the magnesium. And you can tell this because it was a solid here and it's a gas here which means what needs to go in this space is the element chlorine exactly as it was on the line below, because we only atomize one atom at a time. And then the next arrow, they've actually also taken the decision to do the ionization of the magnesium first. And there's no harm in that. To be honest, the chlorine would probably atomize before the magnesium ionizes in terms of which one requires the most energy but the exam questions don't really follow that line of logic. They have shown us that we started with magnesium gaseous atom, and here on the line above, we've got a magnesium singly positive ion. So in order to turn from Ng atom to Ng plus, it must have lost an electron, which we need to put in in this space, and we still haven't touched the chlorine, so the chlorine molecule is going to be the same as on the previous two lines, but we need to have the electron as well. And then moving up to the line above, we've gone from magnesium plus to magnesium two plus, which means the magnesium has lost a second electron. So the second electron needs to be in here. And we've still not done anything to our chlorine, so we've got Cl2 gas here. So that was the second ionization energy of magnesium, and this was the first. Now the magnesium hasn't changed from this line to this line. And so that means we must have done something to our chlorine. So you can see what's missing from my template down at the bottom is we haven't atomized our second, uh, second element. And so we need to put chlorine gas here, but only a single atom, CLG. Now the atomization of any element only produces one mole of an atom. So strictly speaking, this arrow is two times the atomization of chlorine, and that's going to be relevant in the next question. And finally, we've got one last gap. We've now got our gaseous chlorine atoms. We need to turn them into gaseous chloride ions. And that means they need to gain those two electrons that we had up here, and they're going to become two Cl minus. So again, this arrow is not the electron affinity times one, it's the electron affinity times two, because we've got two chloride ions being produced. And this, this arrow, which will be useful in a moment, is the lattice formation enthalpy. And we can see that because it is pointing down. And it's really common 
for us to complete a Born Harbour cycle and then to use it in the next question. And that's what happens here. But for now, six marks for these six gaps, one mark for each of them. And realistically, you're likely to get three, not six. And then in this follow-up question, we're going to be awarded three marks for using our Born Harbour cycle from part B and the data in the table at the top to calculate a value for the electron affinity of chlorine. Now, there's two ways to do this. When you've been presented with a Born Harbour cycle like this, my preferred option is to transfer the value from the table. And so to work your way through, atomization of magnesium is 150, and that's what we've got down there. And once I've put all of the data into the Born Harbour cycle, like I have now, you can then use the Born Harbour cycle to work out any of the missing values. And so our missing value we've been asked to calculate is the electron affinity, which takes us from up here to down here. What we need to do now then is apply Hess's law to this Born Harbour cycle. And Hess's law states that the enthalpy change is independent of the route taken and only depends on where you start and where you finish in terms of the energy of the reactants and the products. And so if our chemical reaction is starting here and it's ending here, it doesn't matter if we go straight there directly, and that's two of the electron affinities, by the way. We can't forget that too when we get to our final answer. Or we can go the alternative route, which is to start on the same line, but go all the way down to the bottom and back up the other side, and we finish in the same position. And by doing that, what we're doing is we're going against this arrow, so it will be the negative of the enthalpy change value on the left, and then we're going against this va value, and this value, and this value, and we're going with that value, and then we're going against this value. So what we're saying then is that the electron affinity times by two is going to be equal to the negative of this value times two, and this value, and this value, and this value added together, and then this value as well. And that then gives us an answer for two times the electron affinity of this. And then when we divide our value by two, we get a final electron affinity of this. And we can do ourselves a quick reasonableness check in terms of the sign of our answer. Since the arrow is pointing downwards, we're expecting it to be a negative enthalpy change, and it is. And so this number can be arrived at using the born Harbour cycle applying Hess's law. Alternatively, if you prefer a method that is perhaps a little bit faster and you don't need to understand Hess's law, for instance, what you can remember is that the enthalpy change of formation, so this arrow, is equal to the sum of all of the others added together. And if you do that, that's just a case of substituting numbers into that expression and then rearranging it to solve for two times the electron affinity. And of course, you will arrive at the same answer both methods for, for this, so minus 364 to three significant figures and to whole numbers. And these are all whole numbers, by the way, so our final answer should be in whole numbers too. So it doesn't matter which method you prefer, whichever one works for you, and whichever one seems fastest. And then the final part of the question moves on to enthalpies of hydration and enthalpies of solution. And when you're working with enthalpies of solution, it's, I think, also useful to have a born harbour cycle in mind whilst you do it. And so the enthalpy of solution is always when you take a mole of an ionic compound and you dissolve it in water to make aqueous ions or to make the solution. And that's what the enthalpy of solution is. Now, you also need to know about the hydration enthalpies, and that's this arrow on the right-hand side. And the hydration enthalpy is when you take gaseous ions, whether that be 1 plus, 1 minus, 2 plus, etc., and you hydrate all of the ions that are present. And that's always exothermic. And then the final arrow is when you take your ionic compound and you break it apart, and that is lattice dissociation enthalpy. And that's always endothermic because making those ions separate always requires energy. And so the enthalpy of solution, this arrow, is the sum of the lattice dissociation enthalpy plus the sum of all of the hydration enthalpies added together. And that's what we need to have in this question 
in the lower part here. But first they ask us to explain why there is a difference in hydration enthalpies for the magnesium ion and the sodium ion. And hydration enthalpy, as I've already said, is the enthalpy change when you hydrate a gaseous ion. But what that hydration is, is the positive ion, in this case of magnesium, being surrounded by water molecules that it is attracting to what's called infinite dilution. And that means that the magnesium ions and the chloride ions are no longer attracted to each other anymore, they're only attracted to the water. And so the question is saying, why is the hydration enthalpy of magnesium so much more exothermic than the sodiums? And the answer to that has to be down to the fact that magnesium is a 2 plus ion and magnesium has a smaller ionic radius, or it's, it's just smaller, you could say. And what that means is we can use our phrase that I really like, charge density. So the magnesium 2 plus ion has a higher charge density. And what that means is the magnesium will have a greater attraction for the water molecules in the solution. It will attract the water, specifically the partially negative oxygen atom in water, more strongly. And so the new attraction will be more exothermic in its formation. Both of those necessary for one mark each, and they're marked separately. So you don't need to have said the first bit before you get the second mark. And then for the second part of the question, we get two marks for calculating a value for the enthalpy change when one mole of magnesium chloride dissolves in water. So they're asking us to calculate this enthalpy of solution for magnesium chloride, which we know from earlier is MgCl2. And so when we do that, we're going to make magnesium 2 plus aqueous ions and 2Cl minus. And so you can tell from this simple born harbor cycle here that the enthalpy of solution is equal to sum, the sum of the other two arrows. Before we can go any further, we need to know what the lattice dissociation enthalpy is for magnesium chloride. Well, we haven't been given that, but what we were given in the previous question is the lattice formation enthalpy of minus 2493. And so that means that the lattice dissociation enthalpy will be plus 2493. And then what we have to do is we have to hydrate the magnesium ion, which has this enthalpy change, and we also have to hydrate the chloride ion, which is minus 364. But there are two chloride ions, and so we have to use that minus 364 twice. And then when we follow this through, we end up with an enthalpy change of minus 155 for the enthalpy change of solution of magnesium chloride. We could also do it without remembering this top equation, and we could find out from a born harbor cycle as we work our way around. But the most important thing, and probably the easiest thing to miss, is that you are hydrating both the positive ion and the negative ion, but particularly you will need to account for multiples if there is two of a particular ion in a formula that you are hydrating. Okay, that's the end of this question and the end of the video. Hope it was useful. I'll see you again soon.